Right. Thank you, everybody, for participating this evening. And we want to thank our partner, the Roseville Library. The Ramsey County Historical Society and the Roseville Library have been partners in presenting the series of History Revealed programs for several years now, and we are very grateful to have their partnership. And we're also very happy to be able to offer these programs virtually. Please consider supporting the Ramsey County Historical Society. We rely on the support of members and friends like you to continue to present these programs and all of our efforts. And there are some great benefits to joining. So you may find out more about these membership benefits and upcoming programs on our website at www.rchs.com. And I'm going to share that screen right now. Um, the program will be recorded and it will be available on our RCHS YouTube channel early next week. So some technical reminders, as I've already mentioned, please keep your microphones and personal cameras turned off and feel free to type your questions in the chat box. We'll have questions at the end of the program. We'll read those out so that John can answer those. And then after the program, we'll turn off the recording and you may turn on your microphones and cameras so we can all chat together. I'd like to uh, say a short statement acknowledging the sacred Dakota land. Minnesota and Makoche, the land where the waters are so clear they reflect the clouds is the ancestral and contemporary homeland of the Dakota people. It is also home to the Anishinaabe and other indigenous peoples. The Ramsey County Historical Society acknowledges that its sites are located on and benefit from these sacred Dakota lands. Ramsey County Historical Society is committed to preserving our past, informing our present, and inspiring our future. Part of doing so is acknowledging the painful history and current challenges facing the Dakota people, just as we celebrate the contributions of Dakota and other Indigenous peoples. For our full land acknowledgement statement, see our website at www.rchs.com, which includes actionable ways in which the Ramsey County Historical Society pledges to honor the Dakota and other Indigenous peoples of Minnesota Makoche. RCHS is committed to presenting the stories and histories of all in our community, and we are so pleased to bring you tonight's program by John Guffman on Clara Anderson. John H. Guffman is a former chief judge of Minnesota's second judicial district and a member of the Ramsey County Board of Directors. He graduated from Cornell College in Mount Vernon, Iowa, with a double major in history and political science, and received his JD from William Mitchell College of Law. After clerking for Minnesota Supreme Court Justice Robert Sharon, he spent 27 years in private practice until his appointment to the bench in 2008. So thank you, John, and I'm going to turn it over to you right now. Well, thank you very much and welcome to, to tonight's presentation. I'm thrilled to be able to do it. I do have a PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to throw up on the screen right now and take you through to begin with uh, an overview of what I'm going to cover today. Uh, a couple of things to remember. Um, I know that not everyone here has read the article that I published in Ramsey County History Magazine uh, in May of 2020. So I'm going to assume that a certain number of you have not read the article. I of course encourage you to do so. And for people who have read the article, this isn't going to be a, a rehash of the article. I'm going to include some other elements as well. So let me exercise my knowledge of Zoom technology and put up our slideshow. And hopefully you all can see the slides. What you see is the, the title of the article and the cover of the magazine that it was published in a year ago. So here are our objectives for the evening. I'm gonna talk about how I got interested in writing the story at all. Uh, it's going to go into a reminder of what the world was for women and Clara Anderson in the 19th and 20th centuries. Well, well past the midpoint of the 20th century into the latter part of the 20th century. And I'm going to ask you to 
keep in mind the events that are going on and have been going on in our city for the last year. Uh, because prejudice is prejudice, bias is bias, and it's incredibly broad-based and has been in human history. And anytime we study it, we can learn something about what's going on today. So as we go through the story this evening, uh, if you're not thinking about it while I speak, put it in your memory bank and think about how we can improve ourselves as people and as a society by learning from these stories and applying the, uh, those lessons to our daily life. You will all pull out maybe something different, but use this information. I'm also gonna talk about the search for Clara Anderson. Um, who was she? Um, could the untold story about her be written without knowing more about her. I'll talk about the story shaking, taking shape and the law developing not soon enough, but it developed. And then I'll close with some comments, hopefully uh, some perspective on why is she a hero? So that's what we're gonna do today. Uh, you learn something new every day. I just learned that if you've got your, uh, pictures of everybody on the side of the screen, you're, it cuts off the PowerPoint. But um, I was asked uh, to go to the dedication of the Otis Godfrey Jr. portrait at the Ramsey County Law Library in June of 2019. Judge Godfrey uh, was actually a family friend. I knew him from when I was a little kid. Um, I hired his son uh, to work at my law firm and I'm still a good friend of his. Uh, so I, I eagerly participated and I asked to do a brief overview of important cases arising in Ramsey County. And one of the cases I ran across was the story of Clara Anderson, Anderson versus City of St. Paul. Of course, there's there are the obvious ones, the Phelan murder, to Eugene Thompson's case, of course. And then, of course, the story of the last public execution in Minnesota, which took place at the then brand new jail. Um, which is still in use today as remodeled property. Uh, that location is uh, currently being used as a, as a large courtroom. And I tried a murder case there two weeks ago. Um, so I did those prepared remarks and I realized a couple of things. Number one, why hadn't I ever heard of this case before? Why didn't everybody know about it? Who was Clara Anderson? And uh, the other thing is the things I le learned in law school about the development of the Constitution and the enforcement of our fundamental rights in the courts, I looked at in a different light as I examined a case where someone tried and failed to secure those rights for herself so close in time to when there was a complete sea change in the interpretation of the Constitution and the standards that are used to review cases. And I'll talk about that as we go. So right away, I was interested. And it started with uh, how we view women and our fundamental constitutional rights in the 19th to 20th centuries. And what emerged in my mind was sort of a constitutional par paradox. As I learned in school, the constitution gets drafted but there was no enumeration of basic rights there. As Jefferson writes in the Declaration of Independence, we're born with these rights. It's, it's uh, self-evident. You don't need to state the obvious, but during the fight for ratification, some states said, hey, we're not gonna vote for this thing unless you specify what our rights are. And so one of the first political promises in history was made, a political promise that, hey, if you vote for this, we'll deliver under our new constitution, a bill of rights. And uh, I guess it was a good omen for the country that one of the first political promises actually got kept. One of the first orders of business was the bill of rights. So now we uh, are stating the obvious, but our early leaders seem to be more advanced in recognizing what our rights might be than they were at protecting those rights. Um, and so, 
to me, as I look at this, our this little paradox reveals our evolution, maybe as a culture, species, or society. First, the concept of equality at all. Uh, despite the criticism that he gets today uh, because he owns slaves, uh, the more you know about the world he lived in, it's amazing that he thought of and had the guts to publish any of this at all um, in Virginia of all places. The idea that people are created equal. Um, yes, it came with all sorts of asterisks, but he had the guts to sit, think it, say it, write it. Uh, and it's, it's astounding that he would say that. Um, today, of course, there's enough hate as it is, but believe me, it was more widespread then in a society like that. Frankly, uh, that society wasn't more, much more advanced than the Stone Age, and they still didn't have a lot of the technology that the Romans had. This is not an advanced society that he was coming up with these ideas. So you have to, you have, to have the concept in, in mind and be willing to discuss what people's rights are. Next comes the willingness of the legal system to enforce those rights that we characterize as fundamental to human existence. That slowly happened. And then finally, you see what's happening now. Um, we, we, can, we have our rights, we can enforce those rights. There's clear standards on how to do it, but that doesn't mean society as a whole is living as an equal and equitable society. Because those concepts have to be cultural values that permeate how we all live in our daily lives. Individual cases that we see come up, unfortunately, all too recently, reveal that we aren't there yet. And then you look for further solutions. So think about all those concepts as we proceed and then try to figure out where we are in that evolutionary continuum. <laughs> because we aren't all born enlightened. Individuals and societies evolve. And it's our job as people to do our best to evolve in a, pos evolve in a positive way. So what did this mean? Well, the rights are recognized, they're written down in the constitution, but whether the law limited a fundamental right, a, constitution, a fundamental constitutional right, treated different categories of people unequally, or exercised routine police power, the standard, until very recently, was the same. If it was rational, it was constitutional. So here are some, some things to keep in mind. For over 100 years, the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause was never used by the Supreme Court to invalidate a gender-based classification. Minor versus Happerstead in 1875, the Supreme Court upholds laws restricting the vote to men. 1908, the court upheld maximum hour laws protecting women while striking law down similar laws applying to men. 1961, the court sustained an automatic exemption from jury duty for women. The woman is still regarded as the center of home and family life. And a little caveat as we proceed, that's the first example. Don't gag when I read you some of the things that judges have said over the years. They said it, we have to accept it, and the world has changed and we learn from it. That's the first example. Um, the first successful challenge to a sex classification came in 1971 in Reed v. Reed. The court struck down an Idaho law designating male offspring as the administrator of the estate when none is specified in the will. Even so, the outcome occurred only because the court concluded that the law lacked a rational basis. So the title at the top remained true even in 1971 at that point. The rational basis standard was the measure for everything. And you can, you can almost rationalize anything. Um, another way to refer to it might be the irrational basis test or, or the rationalized basis test more is, is the way it seemed to work out. So how did this affect women's rights before Clara Anderson came along? Well, the best case study is NRA application of Bradwell. Myra Bradwell was a truly outstanding woman. 
Uh, she was born in 1831, died in 1894. In 1868, she launched the newspaper, the Chicago Legal News, which became the first legal publication edited by a woman. Uh, eventually became the official medium for the publication of all court records in Illinois. And it was the most widely circulated legal newspaper in the nation. So this is a woman who is succeeding in a so-called man's world and big time. In 1869, she sat for and passed the Illinois bar exam, but the Illinois Supreme Court denied her admission because as a woman, she could not enter into contracts without her husband's consent. And for all you legal gurus, that was called the doctrine of coverature, which prohibited a married woman from making legal decisions or acting without the consent of her husband. Basically, as a married woman, she didn't have a separate legal existence. So she went to court. And in upholding the decision not to allow her to be licensed, Justice Lawrence of the Illinois Supreme Court says, that God designated the sexes to occupy different spheres of action and that it belongs to men to execute the laws. It's regarded as the axiomatic truth. Axiomatic truth. So she appeals to the Supreme Court and the United States Supreme Court issues its ruling. Just a second here. And that ruling in 1873, uh, the court said a lot. It was an eight to one vote. Here's one of the things that was said, and I'll let you read this on your own. Um, the paramount destiny and mission of woman are to fulfill the noble and benign offices of wife and mother. This is the law of the creator. Uh, this is also why I gave you the gag trigger warning at the beginning, because of lines like this. And there was only one vote against it. Now, fortunately, um, there was even some movement during Myra's life. Uh, the Supreme Court of, of Illinois eventually granted her a law license. Uh, the state of Illinois eliminated coverage, the coverature doctrine. They granted her a license and the US Supreme Court granted her a license monk pro tunk now for then so they backdated her licensure to 1869 when she first applied sadly she died of cancer only two years later so here we go i'd like you to juxtapose the long quote about that man is or should be women's protector and defender and justice ruth bader ginsburg famous quote the pedestal on which women were thought to stand more often turned out to be a cage. So we're going to protect you by sticking you in a cage and not letting you be like us, compete with us, or live your own life on your own. Um, and that's a really short and accurate description of the practical effect of this longstanding view of women. So on August 18th, 2020, Last year, that was the centennial of ratification of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. That in itself was the culmination of a 100-year struggle. So that struggle uh, is exemplified by the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention in Seneca Falls, New York, which is also the location of the Women's Hall of Fame. And at that time, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott invited delegates and proclaimed the Declaration of Sentiments, which adds two words to the statement in the Declaration of Independence, all men and women are created equal. That was in 1848, suffrage, 1920. So I had a lot to work with. Um, I was very interested in writing this story but I couldn't write this story, I felt, and make it interesting unless I knew more about Clara Anderson. So a lot of the projects I've looked at in the past, I, I would find other articles that have been written about the subject. And I would um, build off of that. I found nothing. I had no idea who Clara Anderson was. The only thing I knew about her 
was the Minnesota Supreme Court opinion. That was it. So I have to find Clara Anderson. In the search for Clara Anderson, I decided to consult an expert. And my favorite expert is my sister, Susan, who I believe is here tonight. She just retired from about 40 years as a librarian in the St. Paul Public Library System. And she is a genealogy expert. She's our family genealogist. She knows her way around genealogy. So I figured if uh, I, I can't invent this uh, ability myself for myself, will Susan help me? She agreed, I was happy. So away we go. And this is in June of 2019. And over the next two months, uh, the needle in the haystack was found. And uh, I was very, very happy. Um, I learned through the finding of this document through Ancestry.com, courtesy of a relative, that uh, I, could, I could trace her steps. And it wasn't easy because the first thing Susan asked me when I asked for help was, what's her name? I said, Anderson. Oh, oh, she said, I'm sure there's only one Clara Anderson. But lo and behold, she was able to contact Kevin Anderson through Ancestry.com, the son of Monty Anderson, who is here today. The, who, and Monty Anderson is the nephew of Clara Anderson. And these contacts got made. And Kevin had posted Clara's baptismal record from the, I'm going to kill this one, Kvitside Lutheran Church in Milan, Minnesota. Do any of you know where Milan, Minnesota is? And that is where Clara was born on August 26, 1909. And this is her picture. Uh, Milan, Minnesota is probably an hour, hour and a half west, due west of Wilmer, which is about two and a half hours west of us on Highway 12. So keep going, you'll hit Wilmer. Keep going, you'll hit Milan. It's got, uh, in, the, in the last census, had a population of around 360 people, and, and it didn't have many more back then. Um, I don't think its census has ever been more than 600 or so. Uh, and this is a farming family. So there's the baptismal record. And if you go about a third of the way down, you can sort of see the shading, which shows uh, the birth date. And uh, this is all in, I think, Norwegian, if I'm not mistaken. It's not German. And Clara is with a K, middle name Grandrud or Grud, 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 Grudrund, G R. U-D-R-U-N-D, -U Christian and Gina are listed as the parents. And suddenly we're on the trail. In the meantime, my sister is looking, I don't think I have this document on hand, I didn't make a slide of it, looking at the St. Paul City Directory and is finding a Clara G. Anderson, matching the middle initial, um, working as a waitress at the Frederick Hotel. Well, that aligns with what we know from the Supreme Court opinion. Here's your Frederick Hotel, which is my background today. The Frederick Hotel was at the corner of Fifth and Cedar, and it um, is the site today of the Allianz Bank, which was the Northwestern Bank built in 1969 which happens to be where my father's accounting office was. So I spent a lot of time on the site of the old Frederick Hotel, starting from when I was a little kid. So we're finding out that she's working as a waitress. She worked at Gilbert's Spa in the 1930s after coming to St. Paul from Milan, Minnesota. Uh, she gets, gets a job at the Frederick Hotel. Uh, according to the St. Paul City Directory, she's got an apartment uh, on West Central Park Place. And if you know where Central Park was, it's where the Centennial Building is today, just south of the Courts Building, which was the site of the old Mechanic Arts High School. So she's living up there somewhere. 
and was a waitress at the Frederick Hotel, later a bartender at the Frederick Hotel. So now we're piecing together all of this information. And um, Kevin emails my sister and says, I think we're related to this woman. And my sister is all excited and tells me this information. And I said, I got to contact Monty Anderson. And by August, uh, Mr. Anderson contacted me and he sent me an email. Um, and it begins very nicely. My name is Monty Anderson and I'm the father of Kevin Anderson who has been dabbling a bit in our family genealogy. I'm 81 years old and Clara would be 110 or 111 years old if she were still alive. I lived in a small town in Western Minnesota and Clara lived a good portion of her life in St. Paul. She would periodically visit the remnants of her family, most often with her brother Erling, which is Monty's father, and his family of which I am one of three children. So Clara's parents were both born in Norway, came to the United States in 1905 or 1906, one of nine children, four born in Norway, five born in Minnesota, six brothers and two sisters, sisters born in Norway, one brother also born in Norway, and he died very shortly after coming to Minnesota, so Clara never knew him. Um, and if you look at the seas, in people's names, a lot of them are K's. So the father uh, of Clara, Christian, could be a C or a K. We see Clara's name with C's or K's, but mo most often with a C. Um, sadly, Monty informs me that I should have gotten on this story a couple of years earlier because um, several of Clara's nephews who lived in the St. Paul area and who would have had much more contact with her had died within the previous year or 18 months of us talking in 2019. And so there was an opportunity to know Clara even better, but it was lost with time. Um, so all of you out there, record your family histories. And if there's anything notable in your family, go to that relative and get as much as you can to save that history because some of Clara's history was lost. So Monty's recollections, many of which were included in the article are of the times that she would go back to Milan and visit with the family on the farm. And um, she, uh, Monty indicated that he made his own trip to St. Paul with two of Clara's brothers in 1951 because he was a big basketball fan and he went to see a Lakers game. Yes, Minneapolis Lakers stayed overnight with Clara. This was March 31st, 1951. He doesn't remember where she was living and he was only there for one night and returned to Milan and the farm the next day. And this would happen occasionally between 1945 and 1950 or so. He also recalls being sick with rheumatic fever in 1950. He was in bed from January until June. So Monty was pretty sick. Clara gave him a radio so he could listen to the Lakers games as he was recovering from the fever. So 1951, the trip that he took to Minneapolis was really a highlight because he'd only been listening on the radio as he recovered from the illness and getting well from rheumatic fever and seeing the game in person was huge for Monty. Uh, he just heard a little bit about Clara's lawsuit. Um, Many years later, Monty was born in 1937, so he wouldn't have been very old when, when all this was happening. At the time he emailed me, he didn't think he would be able to get his hand on any photos because things were in storage, but um, he was motivated and he was able to get me a couple of photos. I'll show you the other one later. Um, um, but he indicated that um, Clara's mother's funeral was in 1941, and there were a bunch of family photos. There was a civil wedding uh, anniversary in 1951, and he goes, pictures were not a big deal in that era. Of course, today, pictures are everywhere. We have cameras on our phones. Um, and so uh, this photo that you see on the screen might have been taken at one of those reunions. So... I had a lot of material now on Clara because Monty uh, was able to find two photos. He sent them to me. 
So now I had a lot of information on Clara. I had places where she lived. I had places, the places where she worked. I had uh, a court record and I knew I would be able to find more information there. So uh, before we get into the court case and this statute that I'm gonna take away from you, I just wanna talk about, again, uh, the world of women. Um, and some people, I don't know how old our audience is, so this is gonna be a pretty fresh, fresh memory for many of you. Um, when I joined, when I became a lawyer in 1981, a membership at the St. Paul Athletic Club came with it. And I was rather surprised to find out that at the St. Paul Athletic Club, there was an area in the lobby that women weren't allowed to be on. And this is in the 1980s. And uh, I, if there's a footnote, footnote four in my article, where I contain a little bit more detail about the athletic club as an example. Uh, at the St. Paul Athletic Club, uh, only spouses of members were allowed in and they could only come in through the side entrance until the 1960s. And when women were admitted to membership on their own, they had to be single, widowed, or divorced. Married women could only belong through spousal privilege. Uh, even after the side entrance was closed, women were not allowed to occupy the lobby lounge area or dine in the third floor grill until the 1970s. So here we go. Well, let's talk about places where liquor is served. Reputable women didn't go to bars. And in the, the late 1800s, according to the 1895 census data, there were 147 female bartenders in the nation compared to over 55,000 men. Of course, we talked about suffrage in 1920, but we also had prohibition in 1919. And the prohibition, suffrage, and the nation's recovery from a pandemic called the Spanish flu generated the Roaring Twenties. And um, one of the sources I found portrayed the women of, of the 1920s repressing Victorian mores, the young woman holding a cocktail in one hand and a torch of freedom in the other, a lucky strike cigarette. And in fact, uh, my mother was pressured to smoke as a teenager because uh, you know, you're not gonna make it as uh, an adult woman unless, unless you are smoking like everybody else. But at that time, society continued to remain uncomfortable with the notion of women being in bars, much less working behind a bar. And then comes the next step, World War II. The men disappear. And a lot of people were thrust into things that they might not have been inclined to or been allowed to do due to World War II. You've all heard of Rosie the Riveter. And one of the authors who has written about the history of women bartenders and women in uh, liquor establishments, and there's a history about everything, by the way. One of my books that I looked at was written by a woman named Christine Sismondo. And the title of the book is America Walks Into a Bar, A Spirited History of Taverns and Saloons, Speakeasies and Grog Shops. Uh, another article uh, was in the Wall Street Journal in, in 2009 called Women Behind Bars. Ha, ha, ha. Get it? And he coined the phrase, Bessie the bartender, uh, to go with Rosie the riveter. And a lot of women became bartenders in the 1940s during World War II. And they weren't called bartenders. They were called barmaids. They even unionized. In Brooklyn, New York, the barmaids local 101 was formed. So there were, so times truly were changing. And as they said, after World War I, once you've been to Paris, there's no going back. Could the, the genie of women fully participating in the labor force and in our society be put back in a bottle? Well, a lot of men tried to put the genie back in the bottle. And as it relates to uh, liquor establishments and bars, those men were the bartenders union. 
turning to St. Paul. Men are coming back from the war and the old guys network wanted to preserve all their jobs. So the union goes to the city council and St. Paul is not unique. Laws like the one on your screen were passed all over the country. Uh, as one newspaper put it, who wants the hand that rocks the cradle mixing whiskey sours? This law prohibited women from dispensing liquor behind the bar or counter unless they're the wife of a licensee or the licensee themselves uh, or the manager if the licensee is in the armed forces. So there's three exceptions. St. Paul passed this law and on June 11, 1945, uh, actually, I think it was May 11th. I might have a typo here. That it had an effective date of, of August 1st. So Clara was going to be out of a job. And Clara had a good job because she said that she made $45 an hour plus tips as a waitress. As a bartender, she made, excuse me, $45 a month an hour. <laughs> Funny. $45 a month plus tips. As a bartender, she got 200 a month, and the Frederick Hotel played, played uh, room board and meals. That's a huge, huge economic advantage. So when that law was passed, Claro decided to go to court, and she filed a, a lawsuit on June 30th, 1945, and she fi hired a really good lawyer. He, she hired Paul Thomas. Uh, this is his photo. He was the president of the Ramsey County Bar Association at the time. And three years later, uh, the year that her case went to the Supreme Court, he was the president of the Minnesota Bar Association. So he's no slouch. I've never been able to document uh, the financial terms of the representation. Uh, did she pay full, full fare or was there a, a break given or a pro bono uh, representation? I do not know. Um, but. This is a St. Paul Central graduate, legal education at the U of M, graduating in 1915. So he'd been around for a while and he talked fast. Um, having a court reporter who's trained me well, I don't talk fast, I'm rather meticulous. They said about Mr. Thomas that no court reporter was ever found who could keep up with his rapid style of speech. And believe me, if someone was like that, uh, they were talking about it at the courthouse. Um, another source of information, if you're trying to research lawyers, uh, are the memorials. So if a Ramsey County lawyer dies, there is a memorial uh, within a year of his death. And that person's full biography will be entered into the court record. So I was able to get the Ramsey County Memorial biography as read to the bar for many of the characters in this case. So the lawsuit was filed against the city, the mayor, the commissioner of public safety, and the chief of police to have this law declared unconstitutional. It was supported by affidavits from other people in the liquor business in town, including female bartenders. And the real uh, thrust of the case is that this is ra uh, irrational and that women behind the bar actually help keep order because once you see a woman there, you're not going to act as boisterous as you ordinarily act. Um, and the case went before a judge quite quickly on a motion for a temporary restraining order. So the legal strategy is let's prevent this law from going into effect and then we'll go to trial and have a trial on the validity of the law. And that's what was done. And in fact, uh, an injunction was issued and the case um, went to Judge Carlton McNally. He issued the injunction, he held a hearing uh, and took the matter under advisement. Uh, judge McNally was a very well-known judge in Ramsey County. Uh, he had a close relationship with the local Boy Scouts. He'd bring every Eagle Scout up to his chambers and give them the, give them the badge. Um, I, uh, we just had our first female Eagle Scouts locally this year, by the way. Uh, he was educated at what's now the Mitchell Hamlin of Law. Uh, he practiced law starting in 1912. He was served in France in World War I. 
and came back. He ended up as the St. Paul City Attorney and uh, was on the bench starting in 1925. So he was an experienced judge. Took the matter under advisement, and he found that this law was rational. And he dissolved the injunction, and Clara loses. So it made the newspaper. Here's, uh, here's the article, September 5th, 1945, is the article talking about uh, the denial of the injunction. I love headline writers. Woman's plea to 10 bar nipped. Judge denies injunction to stymie city ordinance. Uh, those are the words stymie and nipped. Should those be used more or less in our everyday conversation? At any rate, she filed an appeal to the Minnesota Supreme Court, even while the case was still pending for trial. Uh, today, um, th those proceedings might be stayed, but back then they continued. There is Judge McNally's picture. Uh, this is his portrait that hangs in the Ramsey County Law Library. Next, there was a court trial. And the court trial was conducted on February 5th, 1946. Again, the case was already up at the Supreme Court, uh, but the, there was no stay on the proceedings. So uh, the trial went forward. And this is the judge, Albin Pearson. Uh, this is not how he looked in 1946. This is probably how he looked when he served in the legislature um, in the 1920s. Uh, he was born in 1894, died in 1978. Hudson High School grad, went to the U of M. He also served overseas in World War I. He became uh, the first district commander of the Ramsey County American Legion, elected to the legislature in 1923 and 1925, and he was appointed judge in 1930. Uh, probate court first. Uh, he was instrumental in a revised probate court uh, code that became law in 1935. It had not been changed since statehood in 1858. Uh, so he was a district court judge from 1939 until his retirement in 1968. And he taught probate at William Mitchell for over 30 years. Uh, that again came from his bar memorial, a wonderful source of information. So he conducted the trial. We have the advantage of having the trial record. And um, for those of you who are who like to research and haven't researched court cases, I'll quickly stop sharing for a moment. Here's a volume of the court record that contains the briefs in the Clara Anderson case. So I went for the briefs. Um, you also can go to the court file if you can find it, cases that old are probably are in the state archives. Um, but I was able to find the transcript of the hearing that took place. And here it is. Here's an example of what it looked like. Uh, the case came on. So from the beginning, the city attorney, Mr. Karen, K-A-R-O-N, was objecting to the taking of any evidence. He made a motion that the court had no jurisdiction and he wanted this case over with. Uh, Judge Pearson goes, I want to hear the testimony, motion denied. And, and so away they go. And who's the first witness? Of course, Clara Anderson. This is where I got more information about Clara than I got anywhere else. She gives her employment, states her age, where she's from. She has an eighth grade education. She verifies all the information that my sister had found about where she lived and who she worked for in the 1930s. So I've corroborated that. Uh, she talks about how many years she waitressed, how many years she bartended. And uh, it was beautiful. Um, she pointed out, or her lawyer had her point out that she's not a drinker and how she has a calming effect on men in the bar. So um, the strategy was uh, to portray women as the keepers of peace and as an important element to 
having business proceed as it should be. So to further that goal, he doesn't wait for the city to put in its case. He calls a hostile witness, the business agent of Bartenders Local 287. Mr. Thomas wants to prove that this is basically a plot for men to preserve their jobs. There's no virtue here. This isn't rational. It's just, it's just a money grab uh, to keep women uh, out of the competition for work. Uh, he gets Mr. Ward to testify that he doesn't want barmaids all over town and that he wants to put men back to work and it's not the right place for women back of the bar. Uh, isn't that great? And then, as you can see on the page that I'm showing you here, he uh, sort of uh, decided to fish a little bit. He goes, do you go hunting? Well, of course he wants to talk about hunting as a male only pastime. And uh, he also wants to talk about uh, women who might be there for cooking. Uh, so there was an objection. The judge says, are you almost through with them? If so, go ahead. And um, I love the testimony at the bottom. Um, Mr. Ward isn't budging. Um, is it any le more rough or less rough when a woman's there? Is there any difference? Um, with a room full of noisy men, I don't care what they are. When a, when a woman comes in, what happens? And, and Ward goes, it'll make it twice as noisy. You don't think a woman has any influence to quiet a noisy crowd? Not a bar room. Not anywhere, maybe at home. And then the stinger. Wouldn't it be better for your profession if a bar room was as much like a home as possible? Yes, sir. Um, it continued, the testimony was completed. That Judge Pearson gave plenty of leeway. But then at the end, look at his ruling. It's one sentence. It's dismissed. Failure to prove a cause of action. This, uh, a stay is ordered, which is automatic. Case over. So even after insisting on taking testimony, he granted the defense motion to dismiss from the bench, Clara loses. She appeals and here's the article in the newspaper. She's going to the Supreme Court. There's, there, there you go. And here's what she was claiming at the Supreme Court. The two appeals were consolidated into one, they had their oral argument and the case was decided in 1948. So this, this is uh, nearly two years after Judge Pearson dismissed the case at trial. And again, this is the rational basis test on display. Judge Harry Peterson issued the majority ruling. It was a four to three decision. There were only seven members of the Supreme Court at that time. Harry Peterson was a St. Paul native, graduated from the U of M Law School. He was assistant attorney general. Uh, he re resigned that position to accept a Minnesota Supreme Court appointment in 1936. Uh, only two years after his opinion in Anderson versus City of St. Paul, he resigned to run for governor as a Democrat. Uh, but he lost the election and then went back to the practice of law, later becoming the dean of the Midwestern College of Law, which later became Hamlin Law School, and he died in 1985. So that's his story. And really, um, the, his opinion is a perfect statement of uh, the rational basis test that prevailed at that time, and the fact that the Supreme Court had held that states are free to regulate liquor any way they want. So there's no inherent right in a citizen to sell liquor. And um, there's no deprivation of liberty or property uh, to prohibit women uh, in employment from selling uh, liquor behind the bar. Um, it's, it's simply a rational basis. There is a rational basis. There's a difference between women the difference between the sub subjects need not be great. And if any reasonable distinction between the subjects as a basis for classification can be found, the legislative classification should be sustained. That's the way the law was and it always had been. And then he goes on to say, 
it is a matter of common knowledge that the owner of an establishment where intoxicating liquor is sold at retail for consumption on the premises where it is sold in the very nature of things cannot always be physically present to preserve peace and good order and that it is in his absence those functions are delegated to his bartender as the servant in charge thereof. And there is a substantial difference between the sexes as it relates to men and women bartenders and that it's rational because men are better at coping with those potentially violent situations. And then he throws in a, a really patronizing piece of prose. Uh, we think there's a factual basis for the city council's determination that there is a difference between men and women with respect to their ability and suitability to maintain peace and good order in such places. This we think, in spite of the oft asserted claim that as a matter of medical fact, females are the stronger and not the weaker sex. Again, this harkens back to Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's statement, uh, protectionism versus putting women in the cage. Are we protecting women or caging women? And it was on full display in this majority opinion by, uh, by Justice Peterson, which did indeed reflect the prevailing state of the law. But there was a very, um, oh, <laughs> One last thing, um, he also upheld the distinction between women that the state statute creates. So not only is there discrimination between men and women in the ordinance, but women could bartend if their husband ran the place uh, or if their husband was overseas. And is this an unreasonable classification between women? And Justice Peterson writes, presumably, her interest is that of her husband. It is reasonable to assume that a male licensee of a place selling intoxicating liquor on sale has such control over his wife because of their relationship and that she has such a financial interest in the lawful conduct of the business. So I guess that is an illustration of the difference between the concept of equality and the willingness of our legal and system to enforce the rights as they appear to be stated in black and white. A very sharp dissent to this decision. And by the way, here's the newspaper article reporting on the decision, May 7th, 1948. Notice the picture of Clara Anderson. I wasn't able to find a high quality version of this photograph. It looks like a file photograph. The caption says it was taken at the Frederick. So at some point during her legal case, uh, a, a dispatch or Pioneer Press photographer must have run in there and snapped her picture. It says dispatch photo, the papers were run pretty separately. It was probably a dispatch rather than a Pioneer Press photographer. Justice Loring authors a sharply worded dissent and he, he really does go after the majority here. Um, and there's a couple of things from his opinion that I really wanted to point out um, because I think, I think you'll find it rather instructive. Uh, it also is interesting because he put in uh, quite a bit about popular culture at the time. And I thought I'd have a little bit of fun with that. So Justice Loring, uh, interestingly enough, takes on the majority using the rational basis test. He says, I don't even need to get to the constitution. This law is irrational as it's written. Um, it unreasonably discriminates against women serving liquor from, from behind the bar in favor of men and those women who are free to accept employment in any of the other capacities in which they are commonly employed in the bar room. So if you can serve liquor, uh, as a waitress, why can't you mix the drink as a bartender? He views that as irrational. He also took issue with the characterization uh, that um, the bartender needs to be a bouncer. He sort of scoffed at the notion, pretty much saying, if you need a bouncer, hire a bouncer. Um, and he did, he felt um, that the that the principle that the majority justifies the distinct discrimination against women as mixtures of drinks 
is that they do not consider them good bouncers. They say that they do not have the physical strength or disposition to keep order in the bar room. Even if this were true, a complete answer to that, if proprietors desire to have women bartenders and also hire male bouncers, is that to, is that to prohibit said proprietors from doing so is unjust discrimination against women. Women have always accomplished more by diplomacy than men by violence. If physical and mental capacity is to be the basis for classification of those eligible to attend bar, some other distinction than that of sex will have to be found. Under the ordinance, Mr. Milk Toast and Mr. Wimple, not Tugboat Annie, nor Ms. Ms. Wimple, nor Emma Madden, could qualify to assume the heavy responsibilities incident to mixing drinks behind the bar. I fear that this case will be regarded is an invitation to pressure groups to seek to bar women from jobs which they desire to preserve for men, and that it will unjust, result in unjust discrimination in other vocations. And he turned out to be right. So who are these uh, fictional people that he's referring to? Uh, it's pretty rare to see uh, court opinions lean on popular culture like that. But Tugboat Annie was a popular movie. Um, it was based on a boisterous female character that first appeared in a series of Saturday evening post stories. She was later portrayed in the film by Marie Dressler. It was a 1933 film. And the sequel came out in 1940, and it starred Ronald Reagan and Jane Wyman. So uh, that one of the places where they met later became married, Tugboat Annie. Who's Mr. Milk Toast? Casper Milk Toast was a cartoon character created for a cartoon series. The author uh, named H.T. Webster described Casper Milk Toast as the man who speaks softly and then get hit, gets hit with the big stick. The term Milk Toast, of course, is now common in our lexicon, maybe not so much now, but it came to mean a timid, indecisive, and ineffectual person. Similarly, Mr. Wimple. Wallace Wimple was a character created by voice actor Bill Thompson, and it was featured in the radio show Fibber McGee and Molly, starting in 1936. Wimple was a timid, milk toast type of guy who was called Wimp by McGee. Wimpy was already a well-known character from the Popeye series, but it's the voice that endured because the voice of Mr. Wimple later became the voice of another milk toast, Droopy the Dog, who many of us grew up with in Saturday morning cartoons. The only real person referenced by the chief in his descent was Emma Madden, who had recently made news for physically throwing a bunch of boisterous men off a streetcar in New York. So he made his point and he made it strongly in his, in his descent. But this isn't the end of it. Minnesota was not an isolated case. And six months later, the United States Supreme Court upheld on almost identical rationale, an almost identical Michigan law. Gaysert versus Cleary, 1948, Justice Felix Frankfurter, a Roosevelt appointee, upheld the Michigan statute saying again, Constitution only precludes irrational discrimination as between groups uh, of persons or groups of persons. So there you are. Um, this is the legislature's judgment. It's rational. And uh, there's no reason for us to overturn it. Um, so that was the decision by the United States Supreme Court in the Gaysart decision. And he really scoffed at this appeal. Um, he outlines the claim in his opinion and says the claim is that Michigan cannot forbid females generally from being barmaids and at the same time make an exception in favor of the wives and daughters of the owners of liquor establishments. He goes, again, patronizing, beguiling as the subject is, it need not detain us for long. So, and he talks about the history of, of uh, liquor 
the alewife, sprightly and ribald in Shakespeare, uh, but centuries before him, she played a role in the social life of England and talks about uh, the control of liquor by government is ancient and that Michigan had the right to forbid women from working behind a bar, that the constitution does not require legislatures to reflect social insight or shifting social standards any more than it requires them to keep abreast of the latest scientific standards. And he talks about rational versus irrational discrimination. And that really becomes the end of the story as far as he is concerned. So the court has spoken. And the warning of Chief Justice Loring turns out to be true, as there was a huge increase in laws prohibiting women from being bartenders in the intervening years. Uh, so these decisions like Gaser and Anderson versus St. Paul fuel more discrimination on the short term. So now what happens to Clara Anderson? Originally her boss at the Frederick Hotel had written an affidavit that he was gonna have to fire her if the law was upheld and she couldn't work behind the bar. He later softened his view when he actually testified in court and said, I, I don't wanna give up a good employee like Clara, I'll find a place for her somewhere. And the evidence is that he did because the research that we used to find her before 1940 confirmed that after 1948, she continued to work at the Frederick Hotel. Um, the St. Paul City Directory lists her as a Frederick Hotel waiter or waitress in 1948, 1950, and 1951. Uh, we lose track of her, uh, and here's an example of what the St. Paul City Directory looked like. This isn't a phone book, it's, a, it's an actual directory of uh, who people are, where they live, and what they do. The Frederick Burns on the same day JFK is inaugurated, in 1961. I do not know what Clara Anderson did after that. Uh, obviously it's gone. Um, she can't live there anymore or they can't supply a room and board there anymore. Uh, I don't know what she did. So, um, and th the members of the family really don't know what she did either. Here's the second photo of her that I got. Here's Clara later in life. Um, she died on June 22nd, 1975 at Regents Hospital. She was only a few months shy of her 66th birthday. So she was 65 years old at the time of her death. Here's her death certificate that I procured from the Minnesota Historical Society. Notice how it says that she was never married uh, there was one uh, conflict that I had because I got the 1940 census and the 1940 census would seem to apply, imply that she was married to a German immigrant also named Anderson, who was also a bartender. Um, and because of this death certificate and her testimony at her trial, which implied that she was single. Um, I just don't put that much stock in the 1940 census. I, I would need more information to demonstrate that that is anything other than a mistake or a misunderstanding, unless she had a brief marriage to a bartender also named Anderson. This indicates that she uh, died of complications of esophageal cancer. And um, it also gives her address at the time of her death. 325 Laurel Avenue. Here's a picture of 325 Laurel Avenue, which is now the Neil High Rise. Uh, some of you may have driven by it before. So I knew and found out more about Clara Anderson prior to 1948 than I was able to find out between 1948 and her death in 1975. Uh, thanks to Monty Anderson, I was able to get information on the early 50s. Uh, but boy, it would have been nice to talk to one of Monty Anderson's um, 
cousins who may have had a closer relationship with her, um, but alas, that was not possible to do. So when Clara Anderson died in 1975, that is probably the period from the uh, late 60s to the mid 70s was one of the most significant periods of time at the United States Supreme Court for this next step in the evolution of the law. And that is the willingness of our legal system to enforce the rights we characterized as fundamental at the time of the country's founding. If the rights are fundamental, why should be, they be treated no differently than the exercise of the government of its police powers? If certain rights are fundamental, why is the test of their validity no different than the test of whether a statute regulating picking up poop after your dog is constitutional? And those differences finally were made. So what is the legal legacy? What happened? Well, in 1955, Minnesota passed the Minnesota Human Rights Act, but it didn't prohibit discrimination on the basis of sex. It prohibited discrimination on the basis of religion and race, but not sex. Sex discrimination was not prohibited in Minnesota until 1969. The city of St. Paul did not repeal the ordinance prohibiting female bartenders until 1970. This is uncomfortably re recent, isn't it? Then we go from constitutional paradox that I described at the beginning to validation uh, because it really validated putting it in writing uh, in the Bill of Rights. And it didn't end at the Bill of Rights, but that was the start as the 14th Amendment was found to eventually incorporate all of the rights in the Bill of Rights and require the states to provide those same rights to their citizens that the federal government must give to citizens. So the Supreme Court discarded the rational basis test in favor of a strict scrutiny standard that applies when a fundamental constitutional right is infringed, particularly a right in the Bill of Rights or the Equal Protection Clause or the 14th of the 14th Amendment or government action uh, applying to a suspect classification such as race, national origin, or sex, eventually. Craig versus Boren in 1976 ended the use of the rational basis test for classifications based on sex in favor of intermediate scrutiny. So now we have these three levels of scrutiny, rational basis review for a regular old law. The law has to be rational. Um, as a judge, I was asked, uh, in a challenge to a law that required funeral operators to have an embalming room in their sales office, even if they weren't doing funerals there and they weren't embalming anybody there. If they were selling funeral services, they had to have an embalming room. I struck that law down as being irrational. It was unconstitutional. Um, and in fact, there was no appeal from that decision. That's the rational basis test. Intermediate scrutiny. Um, if the law infringes on a protected class like women, it has to further an important government interest by means that are substantially related to the interest and then strict, strict scrutiny. If it infringes on a fundamental constitutional right, it has to be narrowly tailored to be the least restrictive means to further a compelling government interest. And more recent cases are gradually um, you know, eliminating the differences between strict and intermediate scrutiny. Uh, this cartoon um, makes fun of this uh, three-tiered approach uh, that they call the Goldilocks approach. The cartoon concluding Goldilocks in the later years, nothing is just right anymore. The things we lawyers find amusing, right? So let's raise a glass to Clara Anderson, an unlikely hero, as you see a woman behind the bar. Um, so Clara's a hero. What makes her a hero? What makes a hero? What do you have to know about a person for them to be a hero? I gave this article to a number of people to read, one of whom was my colleague, 
uh, Judge George Stevenson, and he came back and he goes, geez, I'm reading your article, and I get to the end, I was shocked. She loses the case. I thought she was going to win. And, you know, um, Americans love a winner, but not everybody wins. And so it, so has this diminished the importance of her story? And I'm going to posit the idea that it not only diminish, doesn't diminish her story, it makes her story all the more important to remember. Look at the 100 years it took for suffrage. Uh, if losing diminishes your effort in some way or makes you less important, were the suffragettes who were dead long before 1920 wasting their time? Hardly. Somebody is, is asked to be even more brave to take on an overwhelming system and be the first person to try it, knowing that the chances are you're going to lose. Now that's, that's a hero uh, because you have to try it before you can build some momentum and people are then going to be willing to follow in your first footsteps. And from 1945, when Clara Anderson started, so, 19, so the 1970s was 25, 30 years when things changed, which is substantially shorter than the 100 years it took for suffrage. So Clara Anderson is a hero, and she was brave, and her story deserves to be told. More people should know about it. And when we talk about prejudice and racism in, in the world today, you need to take a long view to understand how long things take, how long it takes between the time you recognize this, a principle, you act to put that principle in effect so people who are entitled to rely on it can be legally protected by it, but then going that third step that the culture changes and cultural norms change. And that probably takes the longest time of all. And it isn't a, worse, a waste of time to try and be unsuccessful uh, because you need to take the long view. So I would have said those things regardless of recent events, uh, but maybe they're, maybe they're more important now. So that's my presentation today. Um, I hope I didn't ramble too much. I'm actually ending and opening up for questions at about the time I promised um, the folks at Ramsey County Historical Society that I would. So at this time, it's question time. Thank you, John. Uh, we really appreciate, and it was a fascinating presentation. So I'm looking at questions right now. Um, Paul mentioned that stymie should be used more. Its origins are deemed unknown, but possibly a golf term from Scotland, i.e. stymie is a person who sees poorly. So that was a, a fun comment. Um, Jackie <laughs> says- Leave it that, to Paul. We leave it to Paul. Uh, Jackie says that Clara took her case to the ultimate level and did what she could to protect her livelihood and the wheels of justice turned slowly. And then Judy has a question. Okay. Um, she wants to take a contrarian view in that this case arose within two years of the end of the worst war in history. In your opinion, was there ever any justification for protecting jobs for men who are returning from military service after World War II? After all, these men had served their country sometimes at great personal cost. Weren't there arguments made at the time for giving them extra considerations? Well, things like today's GI Bill didn't really exist to the extent they existed. They didn't exist in their current form. And the testimony of the uh, executive secretary of the bartenders union that I shared with you couldn't have been more plain. Um, and, and in fact, the, the authors of the majority court opinions, uh, both in Minnesota at the US Supreme Court tried to shy away from that uh, rationale for those laws and instead focused on the police power of the state and being a rational exercise of police power. Because I think even the justices thought it was rather unseemly that the unions were playing such an active role in trying to keep women out of the profession. Whether it was justified or not, 
You know the old saying, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean no one's out to get you. Whether it was a real paranoia or not, it is unquestionably true that men, and particularly the bartenders unions, were working across the country to get these laws passed to protect the jobs of men returning from the war and men generally. So thank you. Um, Bobby mentions that in some areas, she thinks it's long past time to stop taking the long view and instead expect change to happen more quickly. Um, there were a couple thank yous. So uh, does anybody else have any other comments or questions or would you like to reply to Bobby? Or um, if we're done, we can turn off the recording and uh, open it up to comments in person. One, one last comment on the long view. Remember, um, cultural change requires changing hearts and minds and prejudice is passed on uh, mostly through families and through uh, social groups when people are very young. Um, it takes a long time uh, to change the hearts and minds of people when things like prejudice are so firmly ingrained for such a long time. Um, that's why the, abo the abolition of slavery and, and the Civil War um, was just the first step. There were a lot of very brave people like the Lincolns and the Grants um, of the world who, um, or Sam and Chase, who was the Chief Justice Lincoln appointed, who wrote a lot of dissenting opinions. Um, the separate but equal decision, Plessy versus Ferguson. Those were all a product of those cultural attitudes um, rather than legal scholarship. So then um, Paul also mentions that isn't the Michigan case another example of our Supreme Court being catastrophically wrong? I think you could make the case that except for the Warren Court, the Supreme Court's legacy is mixed at best. Well, I just mentioned Plessy. Of course, we have Dred Scott. Um, you have the Slaughterhouse cases, which um, really clipped the wings of the um, Civil War era constitutional amendments. Um, I think you're right in that regard. I just think it took a long time for judicial philosophy to catch up to the recognition of that these funda fundamental rights exist. Like I said, uh, the fundamental rights and the Bill of Rights would seem to re require a greater level of protection than exercising the police power that would allow you to prohibit dog poop on the sidewalk. I, I don't, I guess, Rationally, I don't see how you would put them in the same category, but until the 60s and 70s, they were. So again, some more thank yous and thank you uh, to your sister, John, for her research. Yes, um, and Monty Anderson, who's with and us. And Monty Anderson. Um, and again, a reminder that um, I'm going to pop up the title page again here, a reminder that new uh, History Revealed programs are on our website at www.rchs.com. And I'm going to put in a plug for two upcoming programs next week on April 22nd, Paul Nelson and Dr. Ryan Hurt will be talking about Charles, Dr. Charles Melchel and the story behind the sexual life, a book he put off, which was also another court case. Um, on April 29th, we're going to be doing a very special program with a number of members talking about the history of the St. Paul Hiking Club. And then a very special program on April 23rd, which is a Friday at 6.30, with the Eastside Freedom Library, we're going to be covering the new book, Hurt to Healing, um, which is a very special publication that has just come out. And you can find information and registration on all these programs on our website. And the recording of this program will be up on our YouTube channel 
probably the first part of next week as soon as it's uh, been processed. So again, thank you all for coming. Thank you to Judge John Guthman. And um, we so appreciate you being here. So I'm going to stop the recording and we can open it up for comments and questions. Again, thank you everyone for being here tonight. Thank you. If anyone wants to stick around and